All right, folks, it's 2.30, so I'll say good afternoon. On behalf of Force Space, welcome to today's webinar, The Plastic Crisis, Alternatives to Conventional Recycling. It has been a pleasure for us at Force Space to collaborate with the folks from Zero Waste Concordia, CP3, or the Concordia Precious Plastics Project, the Sustainability Ambassadors Program, and PhD candidate in the Department of Building Civil and Environmental Engineering, Ali Zakir, to host this event focused on alternatives and solutions to the plastic crisis. I would like to begin by acknowledging that Concordia University and Fourth Space is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Kanyakahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather. Chojage, Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connection with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with Indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. Before I pass things off to our event organizers here today, I just wanted to let you know uh, a few kind of housekeeping items for this webinar. We are recording this event and it will appear on concordia.ca slash four or our YouTube channel. So you can check that out at CU Fourth Space. We're also currently live streaming to Facebook. So you're welcome to share this stream there if you wanna go check it out at CU Fourth Space. We invite you to activate the chat throughout today's sessions with any comments or reflections that you might have. And when you do, um, so we would uh, suggest that you use the panelists and attendees tab from the uh, pull down menu so that both the audience members and panelists can engage with your comments. If you have questions specifically for our panelists um, to address, we invite you to use the Q&A feature in the webinar, making our moderators jobs a little bit easier as the place that they keep an eye on during the question period. Finally, you can also simply just raise your hand and be unmuted to ask your question using your voice. And uh, one last note I'd like to make is that you'll see a live transcript button on the bottom of your screen. Should you wish to do so, you can activate a live transcription of today's event or um, turn on the subtitles for the duration of the event. On that note, I'll, it's my great pleasure to pass things over to you, Matthew, welcome. Thank you for the fourth space for hosting us today and for everyone attending. My name is Matthew Letty. I'm from Zero Waste Concordia, which is a part of facilities management. At Zero Waste Concordia, we aim to reduce, reuse, and divert waste from the landfill. We support student initiatives on campus by helping them access funding and structural support with the goal of eventually institutionalizing the practices. We're very excited about our new partnership today with the Concordia Precious Plastics Project, or CP3 who you'll be hearing from later. <clears throat> Due to extremely low recycling rates, it's clear that conventional recycling needs a massive overhaul. We're excited to show you some of the solutions of how this problem is being addressed and thought of by Concordia students. So <clears throat> this last semester, Concordia launched the Sustainability Action Plan, which is comprised of five streams, waste, climate, research, curriculum, and food. One of the goals of the waste stream is to establish a local materials economy which in place of a linear purchase, use, dispose method is replaced by keeping the materials and usage at the area that they were disposed in. So in short, the materials that we bring into uh, Concordia, plastic containers, bottles, they stay at Concordia to be transformed or reused, in this case into 3D printing material or high quality liquid fuel. Today, we are hearing from Concordia Precious Plastics Project and the PhD candidate, Ali Zakir, about how the current work at the university is setting a stage for us to achieve these goals, as well as how students, staff, and faculty can stay engaged to help. I'm gonna pass it on to Meredith now. Hi, so I'm Meredith Marty Duga. I'm from the Sustainability Ambassador Program, um, which is actually a partnership between the Sea Levy Organization, Sustainable Concordia, and Concordia's Office of Sustainability. And we really love that because our goal is getting students engaged on campus through volunteering and peer-to-peer -peer education. And what better way to do that than as a team? So uh, we're really excited for this webinar and we're gonna be um, doing our best to get you guys engaged with us um, during this workshop. So we're actually gonna start with a quick poll. Um, this is not a test. It's just a really quick way of us getting a sense of our audience, how you guys are doing, where you're at in terms of understanding plastic use, um, especially in Montreal, Jojage. 
So um, those should be up in a, like a little extra side poll for you right now. Um, the questions include which material um, was plastic initially created to substitute? So like, why did we even come up with this? What type of plastic is not accepted by recycling facilities in Montreal? Does it matter if you wash your plastic before placing them in the bin? And what type of plastic do you think you use the most? Um, of course, you may not be familiar with the different types of plastics. You may have only noticed the numbers on the back of your plastic items and assumed they were a mystery. That's totally fine. Um, we are really interested in knowing about how each of us come to learn about our relationship to plastic and recycling and reuse. So we're really looking forward to digging into that today. Um, and it's a pleasure to be able to introduce the Concordia Precious Plastics Project, um, who will be answering a lot of these questions for us so we can check in on are we on the right track with terms of what we assume the answers are to these questions. So CP3 is a student initiative with the goal to repurpose plastic waste on campus, especially waste that's associated with 3D printing into new items. So they're going to cover the basics of plastics for us, the brief history of the material, those plastic types and numbers, what the environmental impact of plastic is, and what we can do at home to really increase the chances of our, our own waste actually being recycled. So um, I'm very excited for the whole CP3 team because I've had the pleasure of working with all of them in the past in my role as the Sustainability Ambassador Program Coordinator and have seen some of the amazing work that they've done as Sustainability Ambassadors as well as CP3 members. So, I will let them get started. Thanks, Meredith. Hi, I'm Sarah. Hi, I'm Adriana. Hi, I'm Ava. Hi, I'm Wanda, and we are part of CP3. So before we start talking about plastics, let's take a step back, actually quite back, back to the 1800s, and discuss about how did plastic come to be. So plastic was patented at first in 1869 by John Hyatt. The reason why the material was invented in the first place was because a New York company was offering $10,000 to anyone who could come up to an alternative to ivory. So ivory was being imported to the country in order to create billiard balls and primarily piano keys, and they needed an alternative to that. So Hyatt came with a material that wasn't 100% synthetic. It was based on cellulose, uh, cotton fiber, and camphor, to be more specific. But what he did, though, was trigger a chain reaction that ended up creating the plastic material that we know today. So in the early 1900s, actually in 1906, the first plastic was patented by Leo Bakeland. The reason why this matters was because that represented the detachment of humans' dependence on plant-based and animal-based materials, meaning that now we could produce something that was completely synthetic using fossil fuels, but back in the day that wasn't as much of a concern of sustainability. And this material could be exposed to heat and solvents, and it was cheaper and faster to produce than cellulose. So in the early 1800s, the research started on how to use this material on modern life. And then came later on World War II. So during World War II, plastic was being used fundamentally for anything where it could have a place, starting on nylon for parachutes, but also car parts, automobile parts, radio parts, uh, telephones, really anything that related to production and that, real, that could be substituted to plastic from cellulose was. When the war ended, that was now this new material and what to do with it. So we were literally started making anything out of it. At that time, it was using Bakelite and we started making cell phones, jewelries, uh, ornaments, and also evolving a bit the way that food was preserved. Tupperware was not just a plastic container, but it also meant that your food could be stored and kept at that same flavor for a longer period of time. Um, now that we were introduced to plastic, Mava is going to explain to us what exactly are plastics. 
Um, so what are plastics? Um, in total, there are seven different types of plastic. So we'll start with number one, which is polyethylene teraflate, or referred to as PETE, or PET. So they make up 96% of all plastic containers and bottles, yet only 25% are actually recycled. So this type of plastic, we find them in bottles, microwavable food trays, and salad dressing bottles. Um, at number two, we have high-density polyethylene, or HDPE. Uh, it is the most commonly recycled plastic because it will not break under exposure to heat or the cold. Um, we find them in different household cleaner bottles and shampoo bottles. Uh, at number three, we have polyvinyl chloride, or PVC. And generally, less than 1% of PVC plastic is recycled each year. Um, it, con it contains numerous toxins, which is harmful to both humanity and the environment. And we find this type of plastic in clear food packaging, mouthwash bottles, and cooking oil bottles. Uh, and number four, we have low-density polyethylene, or LDPE. Uh, this plastic is used in shopping bags, clothing, and furniture. And overall, their packaging and containers make up 56% of all plastic waste, and 75% comes from households. At number five, we have polypropylene, or PP. So for this plastic, um, only a small fraction is actually recycled, which is 3%, and we use them in ketchup bottles, medicine bottles, and syrup bottles. At number six, we have polystyrene or styrofoam, or known by its abbreviation PS. And this type of material accounts for 35% of landfill, landfill materials. And this type of plastic has chemicals which are linked to human carcinogen and reproductive system dysfunction. Um, we see them in disposable cups and plates, takeout containers, and egg cartons. And last but not least, we have the others category, which is number seven. And this category includes other types of plastic, uh, such as polycarbonate, BPA, and et cetera. Uh, as a matter of fact, mean, many BPA products fall into this category and are known to be difficult to break down and leaks chemicals. Uh, they're also known to be an endocrine disruptor, as so in other words, they are nearly impossible to recycle and are super toxic. Uh, we can find them in three and five gallon water jugs, nylon, and some food containers. So on the next slide, um, we can see that each type of plastic contains an identification number, which indicates the types of plastic and which type that can be recycled. So uh, the numbers range from one to seven. So for starters, uh, plastics with the numbers one and two are considered to be recyclable which are PETE and HDPE plastic respectively, uh, while number three to seven are considered to be non-recyclable and non-reusable, which are PVC, PP, PS, and others. However, there are exceptions to the rule, uh, which is number four and five, um, LDPE and PP respectively. Uh, both are considered safe for reuse, but are not recyclable. Um, Unfortunately, plastics with no identification must be thrown in the garbage with other non-recyclable waste. Uh, the issue with this type of plastic that is unmarked well, um, is that there is no way to know what plastics were used to produce them. Um, the materials recovery facility will know how to process the plastic for reuse. And the same issues um, exist sadly for number seven um, plastic since this category is made up with either one single type of plastic or a mix of plastics. So for the next section, I would briefly talk about the recycling process. So in a nutshell, recycling refers to the process of recovering waste or scrap plastic, then converting it into functional and useful products. Um, in more simple terms, um, the process includes collecting, uh, sorting, shredding, washing, melting, and pelletizing. However, um, the procedure does depend on the type of plastic that is being treated. So overall, plastic recycling facilities use a two-step system. Uh, so they start with, a, um, well, with sorting plastics to make sure that no contaminants remain um, in the plastic waste stream. And it's followed by melting plastics into a new shape or shredding them into flakes to be melted and processed into granulates. 
Um, a little keynote here is that recycling varies from city to city. So they can determine from what you can recycle to where you leave your recycling bins. And although there are latest advances in plastic recycling, uh, the industry is still facing challenges. So one of them is lack of knowledge. So sadly, there is still confusion in relation to recycling, um, especially what can be recycled and what cannot be recycled. And a second challenge would be pigmented plastic. Uh, the reality is that more than half of black plastic doesn't end up being recycled, despite being labeled as recyclable. So it cannot be rec recognized by optical sorting systems, which means that they head straight to landfill. And packaging is usually colored using carbon black pigments, making it undetectable as it reflects little to no light. So as we learned just now, plastics are a source of danger for both humanity and the environment. But I'll pass the lead to Sarah, who will elaborate on the environmental impacts. So as Meva just mentioned, there are many different types of plastic and they are all very stable and therefore stay in the environment for a long period of time. This is especially the case when they're shielded from direct sunlight by being buried in landfills. There is a growing concern about plastic pollution because it poses both a physical and chemical threat to wildlife and marine ecosystems. Plastic at the ocean surface level contains, uh, continuously releases methane and other greenhouse, greenhouse gases, and these emissions continue as an increase as the plastic breaks down. As well, at the ocean's surface, and it may interfere with the ocean's capacity to absorb carbon dioxide, which is a major role for many microscopic plants such as plankton. About 90% of plastics in the marine environment become microplastics, which are just fragments of plastic and are available for a wide range of animals in the aquatic food chain to eat, which just results in us eating them as well. Plastic has a very big carbon footprint but so does many of the alternatives to plastic. And this is why it is such a big issue uh, with, with replacing plastic without a clear solution. It is a form of fossil fuel. So your plastic water bottles, your garbage bags, your foam trays, they're all made up from oil or natural gases and it takes a lot of energy to make them happen. 8% of the world's oil production goes to manufacturing plastics. If the production, disposal, and incineration of plastic continues on the current trajectory, by 2050, we'll, we will be emitting the same amount of CO2 per year as 615 coal plants. To give you an idea of what this looks like for Canadians, we actually produce a lot of plastic waste, and it's estimated 3.3 million tons per year. And, at the, and most of it ends up in Canadian landfills, and it's equivalent to 24 CN towers. According to the Canadian government, we use almost 15 billion plastic bags per year and close to 57 million straws per day. About 86% of Canadian plastic waste ends up in landfill with only a mere 9% actually being recycled. The rest is burned to create energy, which causes its own emission problems, or the plastic ent enters the environment as litter, or it's sent overseas for other countries and pollutes their lands. So Adriana is gonna to talk to you a little bit about what actions you can take at home. As Sarah just told us, only 9% of plastic actually gets recycled. However, if you do have some plastic waste and you're not sure what to do with it, you can look at the number identifying the type of plastic. It's usually like on the bottom of a bottle, for example. And in Montreal, all types of plastic are accepted for recycling, except number six, polystyrene, which most of you answered correctly in the poll, so good job. And another thing you can do to increase the chance of your waste being recycled is to wash and rinse out your containers and make sure it's super clean before placing it in the bin. And most of you already knew that according to the poll as well, so good job. Um, but again, since the vast majority of plastic waste is not actually recycled, the best way to reduce plastic pollution is to reduce plastic waste at the source and reuse any plastic that's currently in use. Here are some simple swaps you can take to reduce your plastic waste. For example, instead of using cling wrap to store your leftovers in the fridge, you can use beeswax wraps or reusable containers. Um, you can also bring a reusable bottle, bag, and coffee cup with you when you're out and about after COVID is over. Um, and you can also buy reusable straws or just ask for no straw when you order a drink. Are you guys currently taking any of these actions to reduce your plastic waste? And do you have any other tips to share with the other audience members? drop them in the chat. Um, another thing you can do is do a waste audit to see what type of plastic objects you're throwing out most often. 
And then you can just do a quick Google search to find an alternative or plastic-free option to replace that item. There are also many stores that sell bulk groceries, personal care products, and even cleaning products where you can bring your own jars and bottles from home to refill. So here's a list of some of these types of stores that are in Montreal. There's also a bike delivery service called Brac de Rue. Please excuse my terrible French accent. Um, so yeah, if you don't live near any of these stores, you can actually get them delivered to you um, by bike, uh, zero waste groceries. And another option to buy produce plastic-free is going to farmer's markets and just make sure you ask for no bag when they, um, when you are like ordering your food from the, from the stall. Um, Last but not least, another thing you can do to help fight the plastic crisis is to join CP3. And Wanda will now tell you a little bit more about that. So our mission is in alignment with the UN SDG goals. And it's also made possible because we're inspired by an open source project called Precious Plastic. What we're trying to do is we're trying to implement a plastic repurposing mission at Concordia by taking Concordia's plastic waste and turning it into 3D printing filament and other eco-friendly items to be used by the communities in Montreal. You might be wondering where we'll be doing all of this repurposing and one of our members, our CP3 members, Felix, made this short rendering to showcase what our space will look like. We plan to renovate a shipping container which will house all of our machinery and safety equipment that you see here and create new products out of Concordia's plastic waste. Our mission to repurpose plastic and uh, re reduce plastic waste and then repurpose it, as Wanda mentioned, is, due, is possible due to our sponsors and their generous contribution, both for the workspace and the equipment. The equipment that will be in our workshop include a 3D printer, as you see here, to conduct research about plastic degradation when we are creating new 3D printing filament, as well as a shredder to shred the plastic into smaller pellet size that we can use with all of our machines a dryer to dry the pellets after the shredder to ensure that they are prepped and ready to be upcycled, a filament extruder to create new recycled filament, as well as lots of storage. So here you see storage bins, which will be able to store all of our plastic pellets, separating them by type to ensure that we're not mixing any plastics, as well as our newly filament that we will be making. We will also have toolboxes and workbenches to work on our projects, such as designing and building the machineries that we will be using. And a lot of our members are already currently working on this and creating different types of machines, as you see here, a compression machine. And this will allow us to make different types of products uh, and, and give it back to the community. The Student Center will be a space to work on projects, but also gain better understanding about plastic and find better alternatives to repurposing plastic waste. So thank you for your time today. We ask that you check out uh, what we've been doing on social media and uh, to get more information about the plastic crisis and updates about our workspace. Um, you can also join the movement by joining our team by going to our website, cp3montreal.com slash join. And you will be asked a little questionnaire of what you would like to kind of learn more about and then we'll reach out to you through there. But I guess I'll give it back to Matt at this point. Uh, thanks, CP3. I guess I'll just say it's been a real, for myself, it's been a real joy getting to work uh, alongside them and really just learn. They know so, so much about something that I probably should know a lot more about. So thank you to them for that. I appreciate it. Uh, up next is Ali Zakur, a PhD candidate in the Department of Building, Civil, and Environmental Engineering under Professor Chen. Ali Zakur's research is focused on converting municipal solid wastes into value added products or high quality liquid fuel via pyrolysis. If that all sounds like a lot, he'll explain it and make it uh, palatable. Here you go. Ali, you're muted. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Ali Zaker, PhD student under supervision of Professor Chen. I'm glad to be here with you today. Now let's go get started. Today, I'm going to talk about pyrolysis technology for uh, plastic waste. 
my presentation is divided into four main sections. First, an introduction about the topic, and then I will explain my methodology. In the third section, I'll show you my lab while I'm conducting an experiment, and finally, I'll make a conclusion. Plastics are synthetic or semi-synthetic materials that use long polymer chains of hydrocarbons. The vast majority of these polymers are formed from chains of carbon atoms, pure or with the addition of oxygen, nitrogen, or chlorine. Fundamentally, different types of plastics have different chemical structure, which have been indicated in the slide for each polymer, along with their graphical illustration of common plastic products of each type. Plastics play a useful uh, role in the economy and in daily lives. They are produced in large quantities due to the high demand of their use in agriculture, households, automobiles, packing materials, toys, electronics, and variety of other applications. The left-hand side figure shows the current distribution of plastics demand according to their applications. And right-hand uh, side figure shows the distribution of the demand according to their nature. As observed, high-density polyethylene, HDPE, and low-density polyethylene, LDP, are the most common plastics and account for around half of the overall production. The question may arise why plastic waste recycling is important. Plastic production has been increasing since 1900, from 1 1.5 million tons in 1950 to, 200, uh, to 322 million tons in 2015 worldwide. Canada produces an estimate of 3.3 million tons per year, per year. Meanwhile, leading in a parallel to the growing of generated waste plastics. Less than 10% of plastic waste is recycled. This is problematic as plastic waste is a major environmental threat to, due to the non-degradability. Abuse of plastic also leads to a large amount of fossil fuels depletion and associated to environmental problems, which induce a series of danger towards uh, natural environment, human health, and even lives from plankton to whales in oceans, which brings severe impact on the ecosystem. Therefore, developing an efficient and cost-effective method is in high demand to tackle the plastic pollution and simultaneously convert these waste plastics into value-added energy product. Landfilling and incineration are the main routes dealing with plastic waste. However, these traditional routes are held back because of strict regulation, shortage of land, and environmental pollution for landfilling and release of toxic and greenhouse gases and lack of efficiency for incineration. Aside from the challenge of plastic waste disposal, another global issue is the energy crisis. Transportation, cons transportation consumes one third of the world's energy from coal, oil, and natural gas, all of which are non-renewable source of energy. In this case, the challenge of plastic waste management and, increase, and increasing energy demand can simultaneously be, be addressed by the production of fuel from plastic via pyrolysis process. Pyrolysis is the process of thermally degrading long chain polymer mo molecules into smaller, less, com less complex molecules through the heat and in absence of oxygen. The three major products that are produced during pyrolysis are oil, gas, and char. These products have different applications that can be used as value-added products. Among them, pyrolytic liquid is the most valuable product as an alternative to fossil fuels. I have to mention that unlike tra traditional recycling rules, pyrolysis does not cause uh, water contamination as, and is considered as a green technology. The process handling is also much easier and flexible than the, than the common recycling method, since it does not need an, an intense sorting process, so it's less labor intensive. In order to convert the plastic waste to the oil and gas, I have designed and built a fixed bed reactor policy setup in my lab. The setup consists of the following items, nitrogen cylinder, flow meter, valve, furnace, crucible containing the samples, quartz tube with flanges on both sides, ice bath, a vacuum trap, and a gas bag. 
As you can see, the feed stock is placed in the reactor and then nitrogen is purged into the system in order to maintain an inert atm atmosphere. Then the heating start, which results the composition of the material in form of volatile, which the, cond which the condensable portion is collected as, a, as an oil in the condensers and the non-condensable condensable vapors are collected as the gas. The product yield of the liquid gas and residue uh, along with the oil vary depending, uh, depending on the pilotic parameters such as final temperature, heating rate, residence time of the volatile, level time and the particle size. In this case, based on theoretical and experimental studies, I have optimized the parameters for my pyrolysis setup to achieve the highest yield of liquid fuel. In this section, I will demonstrate a plastic pyrolysis experiment from my setup. For my experiments, I have chosen low density polyethylene, LDPE, as the target plastic waste. The reason is due to the abundance of this type of plastic and non recyclability based on the conventional metals. In this case, LDP has been grinded to particle size of 500 micron, which is an optimized particle size. Then I fill the ceramic crucibles with the LDP to be placed in the pyrolysis reactor. Here in this image, you can see that I'm placing the crucibles into the pyrolysis heating zone carefully. After that, the reactor is completely sealed with the flanges from both sides and from the right-hand side is connected to a flow meter, which is controlling the volume of purged nitrogen. From the other side, the reactor is connected to the vacuum traps, which are immersed in an ice bath with temperature around 4, four degrees C, in order to condense the vapors and collect the oil. Also, the condensers are connected to a gas pack sampler to collect the gas portion from the other side. Prior to running the furnace, nitrogen gas is purged into the reactor for 15 minutes to get the oxygen-free pyrolytic condition. After that, based on the previous optimization studies, different pyrolytic conditions are set with the data acquisition system, and then the pyrolysis process begins. As soon as uh, the reactor reaches the pyrolytic temperature of the LDP, the volatiles start to eject from the reactor and move directly to the condensers as displayed uh, in the image. At the end of the uh, experiment, the oil can be collected from the vacuum trap bottles, as you can see, which the, uh, which the kind of gold color inside the bottles are gener generated uh, as the oil. And uh, here is the uh, collected oil. Also, the gas is collected in Tedler sample gas bags. So the obtained oil and gas then require, requires further analysis related to other physical and chemical properties with different analytical instruments in order to determine the quality of uh, these fuels. So in conclusion, pyrolysis is considered as a potential process to convert the most energy from plastic waste to value, valuable liquid, oil, gas, and char. It's a sustain, the sustainability of the process is unquestionable since the amount of plastic waste available in every country is enormous. The waste management beco uh, becomes more efficient, less capacity of landfill needed, less pollution and also is cost effective process. The dependence on fossil fuel as the non-renewable energy can be eliminated. Also uh, for further information rela related to pyrolysis process, you can read two of my published papers which are available online. At the end, uh, I would like to thank you for your interest and attention. And also I want to thank my dear friends from Zero Base, CP3 and Force Safe for bringing this event to life.
Also, a special appreciation for Douglas, Matthew, and Mackay for coming to my lab and taking the wonderful images used in this uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, it's so exciting to hear about the kind of research going on at Concordia, especially the kind that I would never have been exposed to as my an undergraduate student in the past. So thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, we're gonna jump into the question period. So I wanna invite everyone who um, has a question about either CP3 or LD's presentation to put that in the Q&A now. Um, I think CP3 has been great about answering a couple of the questions that have already showed up, um, but I'm going to pose a question um, to CP3. I know that we talked about, <laughs> and most of our attendees got it right, that um, you need to wash your containers before sending it to a recycling depot, but maybe you guys can tell us a bit more about the reason behind why that's so important. Sure, maybe we can also launch that, uh, the results maybe. Anna, if you were able to do that um, while we're just explaining a little bit. Oh, there we go. So maybe we can just go through them and we can start with the contamination. So uh, 97 of you said that, yes, it is important. And that's really due to the contamination of the food not getting in the recycling machine uh, and, you know, causing problems at that stage of the recycling. And so it kind of there isn't the proper kind of washing system currently in the recycling facility. So doing you know, everyone a favor and doing it before you put in your recycling bin is really the best practice to do. And that way nothing can be thrown out because they won't, if, if something's really gross and bold, moldy, they'll just throw it out themselves versus washing it. So this is why it's best to do it before you put in the recycling bin. Um, and if any of the CP3 members want to take a question, let me know, but I'll, I'll start with number one, which is what material um, was the substitute. So the answer was, I believe, ivory, but most of you said glass. And this is something Wanda covered today in, in the webinar. Um, so hopefully you, you learned something new. And then what type is not recycled in Montreal? That is type six, which we also mentioned in our webinar, but most of you did get, 56% of you got, so congratulations. And then uh, the last one is what type of plastics do you use the most? And most of you said you don't know. So this is a great where Adriana said, maybe do a waste audit within your own house. And this way you can kind of get the feel of where you're creating the most waste in terms of type. And then you can definitely, while you're grocery shopping, you might automatically kind of feel the urge to go towards one product or the other because you know a little bit about the numbers already. And so that's really my, um, pro tip to everyone that wants to start using less plastic is just start when you're at the grocery store. If you flip it over and it's number six, put it back and try to pick something else. Or it can be as simple as uh, going to a bulk store if there's one near you trying to search for those, those solutions. But um, one step at a time, I definitely feel like when I started trying to live the zero waste life, it was definitely overwhelming the amount of possibilities and what can fit with my life and my family was something that I had to find. So take it one step at a time and then you being here today and learning about different plastics is definitely a step in the right direction. I think, uh, I think something that's really fascinating to touch on what you said, Sarah, is like, that's, it's also what fits within your life and your family and your friends and maybe your partner and whatnot. And it's, it's, I've said this before, like, this is my job and I still have a tough time figuring out the rules for boroughs, cities, provinces, you know, the country, international, it's crazy. There's so much to remember, but a really good place to check out uh, if you're looking for answers is an app called Sava'u. Uh, and you pretty much just type in whatever the item is, soggy pizza box. It'll, well, it'll ask you first uh, where you live and then it'll direct you to whether it goes to an eco center compost, recycling, yada, yada, yada. And another interesting point about um, washing your waste as well is that they're human beings, you know, in these places and they don't want to deal with a, you know, a moldy mayonnaise container, you know, it's trying to be careful of other people's health as well. But uh, yeah, I have a question here. Uh, Ali, are you ready to answer a question or are you still doing autographs? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm ready. Is there a max number of times that plastic can, sorry, this is from Anna Timbados. Uh, is there a maximum number of times that plastic can be recycled 
would the new CP3 plastic be able to be recycled again? Oh, I guess it's two different. Wait a minute. I think I asked the wrong thing. I'm sorry. There was a different question here. Um, I think the question that was for Ali um, came from Rebecca Clark. And oh, and he answered asked, it live. Does burning the fuel, does the does burning the fuel from the pyrolysis cause any emissions? Are there toxic ones? Um, are there any concerns there? Yeah, so there is a little bit of uh, carbon dioxide, which is considered as greenhouse gas and also uh, methane, but the amount are comparing to incineration are actually uh, negligible. And also the methane, uh, we know that it can be burned and used as a fuel too. So, but there are other techniques like uh, I have even uh, used some kind of catalyst to even uh, remove that small amount of carbon dioxide from the process. So in general, uh, it, the, the emissions, we don't have that much uh, greenhouse gas emission, especially uh, in comparison to other te available uh, technologies like incineration, which is widely used these days. So I got to learn something new too, which is that there's something called answering live, which I didn't know about. Now, thank you, Ali. Now I'm gonna move on to Anna's question, which is in fact not towards Ali, and it is probably geared towards CP3, as they're mentioned in it. Is there a maximum number of times that plastic can be recycled? Would the new CP3 plastic be able to be recycled again? Great question. It is a really good question. And uh, yes and no. There is always a maximum number of times plastic can be recycled, even at a recycling facility. Um, the ones that like water bottles, so which is PET, can be recycled over and over again. There hasn't even been researched because there's just like an endless amount, but definitely PLA or things like um, other plastics, there's there tends to be a limit more or less. The real thing is just that the plastic becomes less strong. That's like the, the main issue. And if you are recycling water bottles, I go back to this example, they're putting in virgin material as well. So that's what we plan to do at CP3 to ensure that they're also safe. So pellets, you know, purchasing pellets or ensuring that we're mixing, we're also um, gonna be getting from reliable sources of plastic on campus on our first year in order to do that research and to kind of give give our, our, our community the, the results that they need in terms of plastic and, and make sure that it's still um, something that they want to, instead of buying a new filament, they would use ours. So that's something that we're going to do in the first year within our own research. Um, but yes, so to answer your question, yes, there's a number and hopefully ours will be better. That's the plan. <laughs> so I, I saw above uh, from Tahereh, um, apologies if I pronounce that wrong. What is the main plastic film supplier in Canada? I, I'm assuming plastic film, that's that's like 3D printing film or is that filament? Is that the... I think she might mean plastic wrap, like to store food, um, which I'm not, I'm not sure what the major contributor of that is. Um, I could, I mean, filament, I can answer for that one if that's what she did mean. And that's usually in Canada, it's filament.ca is the, the main one everyone gets in Canada, but it's something that's very common to buy. Um, maybe she can clarify in the comments and we can maybe answer after. Okay, cool. I think one other thing that's really exciting to uh, film means plastic wrap for food packaging. Okay, so it was saran wrap. Uh, I'm not sure who the main uh, supplier is for that. Um, so I was trying to find you that answer, Tahara, and uh, I don't have access to like paid statista, so it's very hard to know exactly who is taking that space in the marketplace. I would assume though that the, pr the producer of food packaging is the same producer of other types of plastic. I don't think they specialize just in one segment of production. Um, but yes, if we come up with the, if we are able to access the data and find it, we'll be happy to share it. I guess I have a question for everyone. Uh, why is it that saran wrap can't be, uh, can't be uh, recycled if it's plastic? One of the obvious reasons is that it's usually dirty, right? Like whenever you use the saran wrap, you're wrapping some food. 
Um, so that would be one of the reasons. Uh, Sarah, do you want to answer it? I don't think anyone puts it in the recycling bin to begin with. So it just automatically goes to landfill because we're all putting it in the garbage. I mean, I'm, I'm saying all of us, but who knows what everyone's doing. But I think, yeah, number one is contaminating. And there's also no number. That's something that's really not kind of spoken about is this identification number because right now a lot of facilities are just kind of separating it by eye and checking the number and then separating it by type versus uh, uh, more automated things. I mean, I'm not speaking for everybody, but it's just a very traditional way of doing it is separating by hand by having workers actually do it. And I don't think they'll want to pick up dirty cling wrap and then having to put it into something else. Sure. Thank uh, you so Ari much, Luis, Sarah. Isn't, sorry. Um, I wanted to just pose a question to Ali. Um, your like <laughs> research is such an interesting new topic. Can you tell us um, maybe a little bit more about your academic career and what got you interested in the pyrolysis process? Uh, yeah, sure. So since uh, my background is uh, chemical engineering and uh, I, has, I, ha I used to do research on the production of uh, bioethanol and biodiesel. So I always, uh, and always environmental uh, pollution was my concern. So turning uh, different municipal solid waste such as plastic or sewage sludge was my concern. So I, become with this uh, technology, the paralysis, uh, which can actually not only reduce the amount of the waste that are gen generated from our cities, but it can turn it into valuable products that, are, as I mentioned in my presentation, like uh, oil, gas, and also char. So by if we have uh, these products, and so we can make this process uh, commercially available because uh, right now this uh, kind of process is under development and research and due to some kind of expensive equipment that uh, this process requires, it's hard to convince the decision makers to use this kind of process for our cities. So, but if we can produce some high quality fuels uh, from this process, so it, we can convince them to uh, substitute their uh, current uh, technology, for example, the incineration that is used in Montreal by pyrosis. So it's going to be not only help our environment at the same time, but actually uh, from commercial point of view, is uh, we can uh, in we can make money out of it. So that's why. Uh, I would. I was always uh, thinking to this process uh, since my bachelor. Very cool. Thank you so much, Ali. No um, and I think that sort of leads really well into our next question, um, which is from Diego. So um, maybe someone from CP3 can answer it, and then Ali can answer again. Um, but Diego is wondering how energy intensive both the pyrolysis and the 3T, the 3D printing processes are. Um, and like, do you see these processes as being viable in large scale, for example, actually like dealing with the city of Montreal's waste um, rather than just being focused maybe to the university? Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, since this uh, process now is under development and research, so the, the quality of these products, especially the liquid fuel that is produced from this process is really important. Because right now the fuel that is obtained from this process uh, is not comparable to such as uh, available uh, uh, based uh, fossil fuels that we have, such as, for example, jet fuel or diesel fuel. So if we can achieve this goal that the, qu the quality of the liquid fuel can be comparable to, the, to other uh, available uh, fossil fuels, so then we can go, the next step is to go to higher scales and commercializing this uh, process. So as I mentioned, to convince the decision makers 
we have to have high quality liquid fuel from this process in order to convince them. Otherwise, they're going to continue with their own uh, conventional processes that are available right now, like incineration. Thank you, Ali. Uh, I just want to quickly mention something before uh, getting to uh, a DTS question. What's really cool uh, for us is being able to just find these people at Concordia who are obviously doing just, I mean, making 3D printing stuff from plastic and making fuel from plastic is just crazy. Like if anyone out there has ideas or research they want to do or questions or is looking for a place to volunteer and all that, just drop us the line at Zero Waste and uh, we'd be happy to either put you in touch with people if they, you know, if, if it's geared more at CP3, obviously, you know, reach out to reach out to them or better yet, join their team. Uh, yeah, I just want to thank you guys for that. It's really awesome. I'm going to get to Aditya's question. So I think we're still waiting to hear from uh, CP3 about their sort of large scale visioning for the project. Oh, okay. Um, so I guess to answer the question from before was how much energy is required for the 3D printing process and if it can be upscaled. So our plan is really to do this kind of pilot project within Concordia and then the sky's the limit, right? And if you know Montreal wants to try this out on a larger scale, we're definitely um, willing to do that. I think it gets a little complicated with coordinating with facilities, but if we have direct donations like an eco quartier or eco center and it's plastics coming to us directly, we can definitely um, have a better control of what's coming. And in terms of 3D printing, that energy is, is we're going to have one 3D printer, so it's not that bad. And in most of our other things as well, and that we're not planning to make a production line of any sort. We're just, this is really um, on need basis. So the energy we'll be producing at Concordia will be also slim. But um, obviously, if we bring this upscale, then, then that would be upscaled as well. Um, I also agree with you, Matt, in saying that uh, there are people who've been messaging with questions in terms of uh, things that they're interested in. And I've been saying, if you're definitely interested to reach out to us on social media, and there's things that people are suggesting, which we have teams already working on. So you can definitely join us. And uh, we'd love to hear more about what your, your ideas are in different subjects. Okay, um, so now on to Aditya. Sorry, I realized I snaked your answer there. I didn't, uh, I, di I didn't realize it was to, uh, for both people. No. From Aditya, what is meant, what I meant to ask is, is pyrolysis more useful than WTE technology? Um, I'm not sure what WTE is, I'm sure everyone here knows, uh, especially since it's hard to segregate plastic waste unless you, oh God, the chat's moving, unless you engage with recycle, a recycling center on an industrial scale. That was the worst uh, reading of that. I, so <laughs> honestly, I don't know what is WTE means too, so. Waste I, to energy. Oh, so we have uh, many different uh, other processes, waste to energy. What, 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 uh, is your main uh, point from waste to energy? What kind of other technology? Like, I don't know. Can I, you I clarify think... that a detail? Yeah. Maybe well, incineration, like. Yeah. Incineration is not uh, for especially plastic is not considered as waste to energy process because most of uh, the material is just burned and it's produced high amount of greenhouse gas. And especially for plastic, even it's not going to be, we're not going to have uh, any residue left. So somehow it's not uh, going to be considered incineration as a, a waste to energy process for uh, for example, I know that in Montreal for the wastewater treatment plant that they have, uh, for example, they burn the sewage sludge in incinerators. These incinerators are uh, accounts for one fourth of Montreal's uh, greenhouse gas and air pollution related to the operation of the city. Only from uh, sewage sludge, maybe a little bit of uh, residue is left that is uh, used in cement industry. But as I mentioned, it's not considered incineration as a waste to energy uh, process. 
so we can mention gasification as another option of uh, waste to energy, but that uh, process uh, is more for production of uh, biogas or gas. We cannot get any bio oil or residue from that process. And it goes to a really high temperatures over 1000 degrees C. So it's really uh, not considered as a feasible, feasible uh, option. Thanks so, so much, Ali. No problem. Um, I have um, one more question, which is just we've talked about, um, CP3 mentioned that it is extremely difficult to recycle um, plastic waste that doesn't have any numbers on it. Um, can you tell us a bit more about sort of the motivation for companies not to label their plastic? why does that keep happening? Um, because uh, for me, especially in lots of the workshops we give, I, I have lots of questions about, from students about what do we do with this like unlabeled clear plastic that I, everything comes in? So um, this will really be my opinion. <laughs> I please don't fact, I mean, please fact check me, please don't take my word for as a fact, but I personally think it's, to do with cost and having to stamp the product or creating a mold that has the number already in the mold is costly. And so some productions that want things to be happening fast might overlook this. It could also be because the plastic isn't recyclable or it's a mix of plastic. So then there's just not a number to be associated with it. That's really the, the my issue with plastic is that there's new ones being invented and developed every day. And so there's just one to seven that we categorize, but there's really more than that and things are being mixed and then that doesn't have a number. And so um, that can be the main source. I could also tell you how we're trying to tackle this at CB3 and we want to implement sort of a stamping system. So when people are 3D printing on campus, they'll be able to kind of melt a little bit of the, uh, with, a, with a hot coin or with a ceramic and put that number so that we will be able to know what it is when we recycle it. Or if you put it in the recycling bin, it'll have the triangle and the number. And so it'll be able to be repurposed at a different stage. And this can also, is just to encourage people who are doing designing to think about this in your design, because we tend to just think about the product and not about the end of life of that product. And so it's something to consider um, when you're doing any stage of design or even your just working with, with plastic products. Thank you so much. Um, Ali, if you still have your PowerPoint open, if you could reshare that last slide, um, just because there's some people <laughs> in the chat asking about um, your email to get in contact with you. And we'd like to make sure that everyone's able to do that. Um, we wanna wrap up by, um, yeah, thanking everyone from, um, CP3 for joining us today, Ali for talking about um, his research. It's been, um, you know, really encouraging to be able to see the types of research that are going on to address this issue as we come to better understand how little is currently being recycled. So thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us um, today for this learning session. We really appreciate your comments. Um, all the questions uh, were really amazing and um, I know that there's maybe a couple that we didn't quite get to, but we want to encourage you to get in contact with Ali, to um, chat more about his research, to get in touch with Concordia Precious Plastics Project, especially if you would like to become a team member. They are looking for people to actively join. Um, if you're interested in getting involved in peer-to-peer -peer education on campus that has to do with sustainability, I want to invite you to um, join the Sustainability Ambassador Program. Um, we have a couple of options. This semester, we've just been giving out um, a workshop series on sustainability to get people educated. And we're hoping to be able to um, resume safe social distance uh, volunteering and educational opportunities, either on Zoom or on campus as soon as possible. Um, so I just threw in the chat or very simple, it's concordia.ca slash sap because it's two S's. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much to the fourth space, um, Anna and Douglas for helping us with this. 
I will pass it over to Matt to, to wrap up about zero waste. Probably unmute myself. Um, yeah, again, for, for me, what's really exciting is I've been I've been really grateful. Uh, I started studying in 2012 and graduated and now work at Zero Waste Concordia. And I've been really grateful to be connected with all the amazing people doing really, really important work at the campus, you know, like these are really serious issues. And uh, I'm just always completely blown away by people who know so, so much more than I do. And it's always really exciting to hear from them. And I want to thank you all for coming. And uh, yeah, if you want to get in touch with anything, if you have ideas, if you, you know, whatever, just drop us a line. We're around Zero Waste Concordia. And uh, yeah, thank you all. Thanks to Four Space putting in such amazing work. And uh, yeah, thank you all. Have a great day. Stay safe. Thanks, Matt. And uh, on behalf of Doug and I, who just popped into your Zoom here at the end, Adriana, Matt, Meredith, Sarah, Mava, Wanda, Ali, you did such a fantastic job. Thank you for your time and your generous kind of sharing today. And I'll remind everybody who's still here that you can review a recording of this video. There's a lot of information today that maybe you didn't absorb and maybe you want to share with your friends and loved ones and um, neighbors and whomever you think might benefit from it. So the recording will be available on concordia.ca slash four or on our YouTube channel. Just look us up at CU Fourth Space. Thanks again, everybody. Thanks for animating the chat, all the Q and A's and, uh, and for generally sharing your knowledge with us. We wish you a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a great day. Thanks hey, for great having job. Us. That was awesome. Bye. Bye.